Now we start with the next talk. Uh, therefore, I, a warm welcome to Lucas Fulcier. Um, he is a developer of a new protocol. And uh, what it's about, you will hear in the next uh, talk about the Finier project. Give him a warm applause. So thank you everybody for coming here. And uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, this project of mine that I started as my master thesis and then kept uh, working on. It's a new transport encryption and uh, well authentication protocol and the emphasis is on the authentication part. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is why do we need another protocol? Uh, we have so many of them. TLS works fine for everybody. And uh, as everybody will tell you, you do not roll out your own crypto. Um, for me, it's a journey that started with uh, solar panels. Because like everybody will like uh, solar power, so we put, uh, uh, we put some, some panels in our home. And uh, like any hacker would do, we started, I started to reverse engineering the rest to through po protocol uh, for the inverter, uh, um, send the data through SNMP to make some graphs, and that was it. Um, if you have ever uh, had to work with, uh, with protocols like SNMP, you, uh, <laughs> you might have had to study a bit to uh, to understand what is going on behind the scenes, uh, uh, to understand how the protocol works, and um, uh, well, and to make it work. Uh, the reason was well. <laughs> uh, also, uh, this was not a very long-lived protocol. Uh, sorry, a long-lived uh, project because well, Murphy had something to say in it, and uh, it didn't last more than a couple of weeks. But still. Uh, it got me starting. The, um, it got me starting in the protocol uh, study, and um, and I still think that the SNP history is is a great place to start. So again, uh, it mimics the the history of uh, a lot of other protocols. First version, everything clear text, everything uh, well. It's just welcome to the hacker. Uh, second version, we had security, but uh, we're not good at it. Uh, um, nobody, uh, nobody implements it. It's difficult uh, to, to actually implement it. So we go <laughs> back and forth. Um, we have the V2C with the V2 features and the version 1 security, which is basically none. Until finally we get it right with uh, some uh, encrypted and authenticated version. We see this all the time in uh, everyday protocols, like uh, uh, the usual TCP and TLS, which is feature first, security later. Uh, but you can say, well, this is because of legacy. This is because the protocols are old. Uh, the truth is it's that we haven't learned it uh, really well. Like, um, if you've studied a lot of other protocols, like uh, SCTP and DCCP, which were standardized, I think, in uh, 2001 for a CTP and 2006 for DCCP, uh, you will still see that everybody's clear text and security is completely forgotten. That is until some uh, new protocols, experimental protocols like uh, Quick and Minimal T, which were both uh, born, I think, uh, three years ago, something like that, uh, which um, well, the main reason for Quick is to try and pull TLS and TCP together and, uh, and also add some multiplexing in the streams uh, so you can have multiple streams of data in the same connection, basically what, uh, uh, what Speedy and HTTP do are doing. Um, and everything runs on top of, uh, could run on top of IP, but uh, technically runs on top of UDP to get through firewalls and stuff. Um, what does it mean security fee first, uh, sorry, features first and security later? It means that the packet looks uh, a lot like this. Clear text everywhere. We can track connections. We can uh, reset connections. Uh, maybe even do some passive fingerprints on the options. And then finally, we have um, our data in the, um, 
after, well, in the TLS sections. Uh, we can also see here that uh, TLS is still in the uh, Mac first encrypt later uh, mode. Uh, the TLS 1.3 will, will change that and go encrypt first uh, Mac uh, than Mac, uh, which is which is thought to be uh, some, somewhat more secure for a lot of reasons. We, go, we won't go in it. And, um, and this is what I mean when I say uh, security first, uh, features later. Uh, this is the quick uh, protocol. And it's, uh, well, the first thing we notice is that uh, Google tried to make uh, everything uh, as optional as possible. So you can skip out whole sections, like even the connection ID is, uh, um, can be skipped out because if you have the UDP tunnel, use the UDP connection as an identifier. Uh, but, uh, but still, uh, as, um, um, the only clear text parts are the, the, the thing that you need to decrypt the packet or the things that are related strictly to the, uh, the handshake part of the protocol. Uh, well, finally, we have uh, some multi-stream support in uh, the stream ID and uh, an offset which mimics the, well, the offset mimic, mimics the sequence numbers in TCP. Uh, minimality that I mentioned before looks a lot similar, uh, but the packet structure is more fixed and thus uh, very easier to parse. Uh, but still, the, the, overall, um, the overall sections are the same. Only the, the clear text only has the, part, um, only has the part that are needed to decrypt the packet, and then the packet has the actual data. Um, Minimal T still has support for multi-stream. If you want to know which are the uh, the RPC part, which can be repeated in the in the same packet, same as stream, same quick. So for our protocol, I went for something very similar to Minimal T with a connection ID. Um, each uh, when you see connection IDs like this, um, each part of the connection uh, generates its own ID and sends it to the other, so there is no clash or synchronization needed. Um, then we have some multiple streams, which will be which we will see more in depth later, and some some checks. Some the it's really the same thing as as before, except maybe for the padding, which uh, I put at the beginning to uh, I'll randomize a bit more the the internal structure of the packet to. Um, to make more difficult uh, some um, some traffic analysis uh, or, uh, or or other small attacks, uh, there is also the option for byte alignment, but that um, I don't think Quick uh, supports. In in Quick, everything is byte aligned, and uh, I'm not sure about minimality. Anyway, the first thing we do uh, when we when we build our, our application is to select the stack of protocols that we will use. Since today everything runs on the web, you will always start, always start with something like this. TCP, TLS, HTTP, WAUT for your authentication, and finally the application. Which is fine. It's, uh, it's nothing wrong with this. Um, and it works until you need to add uh, things like uh, um, uh, chat video, uh, audio, audio streams that uh, do not really work that well with uh, reliable connections. And you cannot do with the stacks. You need to add another stack and uh, manage these uh, two in your applications. Um, maybe even synchronize the authentication of how that you do in one stack on the other and things like that. It gets even more complicated if you want to do something like multicast and uh, and yeah, if your application has to synchronize all of this stuff, uh, everything is pushed on the, all the complexity is pushed on the ap application, and we can really expect uh, normal application developers to get this right every time. So big frameworks uh, and, uh, and other stuff uh, everywhere. Um, what we want to do instead is probably move the, the management of uh, all of these tags inside inside the streams that we had before. 
but in um, uh, it's something that, uh, um, that both quick and minimal team missed because they stick to TCP-like connections. Uh, there is some some way to do uh, UDP-like connections so, um, streams in quick, but it's more of a hack than uh, than the way the protocol is, is thought. And and still, none of those protocols, at least at least as far as I know, support multicast. So. In Ferrir, uh, we have an explicit creation of the streams, uh, even during the handshake, so you don't have to waste more uh, round trips. And we can have any combination of uh, reliable, uh, unreliable, ordered, unordered data stream or datagram, basically any, any, any that, you can, that you can think of, even some that are quite difficult to manage them. Um, Something that Quick introduced in protocols, but was already done uh, in, uh, in other parts, so it's not really a complete innovation, is uh, the forward error correction of packets. Uh, Quick introduced something like uh, RAID 4 for the network, where uh, every two packets that you send, you send XOR of the two packets, so you can lose uh, one of the two packets and, uh, and still get your data. Uh, I developed, and uh, you can you can use now the libraptor queue, which implements the raptor queue algorithm, and it's actually a generalization of this uh, uh, linear combination of uh, of packets, so that uh, we can generalize on any number of packets from the source and any number of uh, repair packets. So, so you can actually tailor your uh, uh, error correction depending on uh, on your network properties. Um, Finally, multicast support. Um, multicast is, needs to be treated a, a little bit different, though, because, um, for example, we have uh, support for multicast even in the DTLS uh, specification that is in an RFC, but what it does is basically just um, share the same key with everybody, which works, it's fine. But then uh, every client can impersonate the server uh, with uh, or sending data to other clients, pretending to be the server, simply because well, it's the same key. So uh, to fix this, in, um, in Ferrier, we simply uh, reserve a connection ID, and uh, the identifier for the multicast connection is actually the. Uh, the public key, which is uh, we use elliptic curve, elliptic curve cryptography uh, through Lipsodium, um, and then we sync uh, the the packet with the with the public key directly. Uh, elliptic curve cryptography is fast enough for this. Uh, we it was something not really possible with RSA, which which is somewhat slower. Uh, the the nice thing about uh, managing anything, everything in the same protocol is that we can also associate uh, uh, that uh, the multicast connection is actually associated with the unicast with one or more unicast connections, and uh, it means that we can use the multicast connection to just send the data to the clients, and then use the unicast connection to send more recovered data or the packets that were lost, and we can have something akin to reliable multicast, which is nice. Uh, still, we we were talking about the application stuff, uh, the the application stack. Let's uh, look into it a bit deeper and compare it to the the OSI layers. Uh, in the OSI layer, um, pile it, the, the stuff like authentication, encryption is not uh, um, is not included because you can do it at multiple levels. Um, but we can see some interesting stuff like uh, uh, TCP and TLS uh, uh, and HTTP well, are both transport protocols, but while TCP and TLS have their own sessions, um, which are different because the TLS sessions need to be cryptographically, uh, cri cryptographically verified and everything, uh, HTTP does not support sessions, uh, so you actually need to reintroduce the session in, with the cookies and um, and also <laughs> and also have a different session for the authentication in OAuth, which need to be synchronized in the, with the cookies and and this is what we mean uh, what I meant before, where the 
the complexity is pushed to the application because now you have to synchronize uh, things like the UAU, the cookies, uh, manage the, uh, the session that, you, that HTTP took away and, and stuff like this. Uh, we have also multiple ways of, multiple points where we do uh, the authentication and we cannot really fix the, um, the session part it's because simply HTTP took it away. Uh, we can do something for, um, for the authentication. So what are the authentication models possible? The, the most simple one is the client server uh, that is used in TLS and, and, well, and, and, uh, and uh, what, what your application can uh, easily implement. You have a, a federated model like Kerberos and uh, OAuth, wow, which, is, which is somewhat of a mesh between the client server and the federated, because it should be, it looks a, lo a lot like the federated model, uh, but then you don't have uh, automatic discovery, and uh, things, are, uh, things are difficult to implement, and, and anyway, all of these models have their own problems, like uh, uh, the client server model only, with can give you too many user and passwords, which is our current problem, or uh, or you can use a certificate with, and then you need to uh, to think about renewal, revocation issues and stuff. Uh, the Kerberos uh, federated model is actually a very good one, but uh, it requires clock synchronization, which is uh, very difficult for embedded stuff like uh, the badge, which is uh, auto update failed. Nice. Um, like this badge, which does not have a, a clock inside and still requiring clock synchronization on the internet is uh, something that you probably don't want to do. And uh, finally, OAuth is just a big pack of nope. If you follow the, the development of this protocol, you will already know that uh, <laughs> there are fun stuff like the, um, uh, the main author of OAuth 1, which worked in OAuth 2 and got away a couple of months before the, uh, the standardization of this protocol, asking for his name to be taken out of the, uh, all the documents inside. Um, it was, they tried to standardize this as a protocol, but it's so loosely defined that uh, they couldn't do it, and so it's actually just a framework. And, uh, and it works. I mean, it's, it's safe, everybody use it, because uh, uh, cryptographers and uh, security people have gotten together, and, uh, and now the libraries that you find on the internet uh, are actually a very specific subset uh, of uh, OAuth, because if you, you can actually have uh, implementations of OAuth uh, um, that, uh, that are completely uh, conformant to the, to the specification, but also completely insecure. So do, do not reimplement implement OAuth. Uh, what I've chosen for this project is the federation model, and I actually try to uh, separate the, um, uh, the various, the various um, <laughs> missing the words here. Uh, the various uh, parts of, uh, of, this, of this federation. So you have your application, uh, like uh, your web browser, uh, the client manager, which is uh, something that, uh, um, I don't know, like uh, in the Kerberos model, the, the application that manages all your tokens and, and, uh, and authentications. Then you have your server service, which can be the, uh, uh, the web server. And finally, the, the authentication server, which is a um, separate entity from, from the service. Um, an overview can be something like this, where the application connects to the manager local in the same machine. Uh, the manager does all the handshake and authentication and token management stuff uh, with the authentication server, which then just uh, notifies its service, because the service is, is inside the same domain uh, that the authentication server manages. About well, it notifies it about the new user. It sends back the keys and connection information, like connection identifiers and other stuff, which are sent back all the way to the application. And now the application can connect to the uh, service directly uh, without any more handshakes uh, or round trips uh, and stuff. Um, this is actually one of the few models that you can have uh, without the clock synchronization. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's good enough, and also uh, 
as I said, formally verified through, uh, through mathematical properties. Um, this, uh, the previous slides left a, a big hole, hole, however. What is the trust model of the, of the whole system? I mean, we, can we could just use the certificate model, which has a lot of different problems as we know it, or we could you could just use the NSSEC, which is almost uh, available for, uh, for any TLD domain now. And, uh, and so that's what we do. We, um, we create a binary uh, with, uh, uh, with information like uh, uh, multiple authentication service, uh, um, IPs, UDP ports to connect to, uh, multiple public keys so that, so that you can do um, rollout of new keys uh, uh, very, uh, very seamlessly and uh, hosting support is, is easy to do. Uh, we don't use the X509 uh, uh, certificates, just uh, plain keys. Um, because, well, X509 is a very complex uh, and, and very abused standard. Uh, I think the implementation in GNU TLS is like 35,000 uh, lines of code just for parsing the certificates, which is uh, <laughs> a bit too much. And um, also, we don't strictly standardize on a single trust mode, so you can extend it, and it's all managed via plugins if you want to, um, if in the future we want to add something like GPG, we, we could uh, add a TLD, just like the, the Tor guys do, and, uh, and get info from the uh, web server and save our, uh, our binary uh, encoded uh, inside some description field. So it's, um, it's very easy to extend. Uh, also, Z85 was chosen for the encoded because it's uh, somewhat more uh, efficient than Base85 and is actually staying safe. Um, we were talking about uh, authentication. Authentication is handled uh, directly uh, in the handshake, uh, which are designed to uh, to avoid completely any kind of amplification attacks, uh, which also means that we cannot have uh, uh, zero round trip connections, like uh, like what minimal T and Quick uh, actually do. Uh, it's a design choice uh, mainly uh, because uh, this way we avoid uh, any problems with uh, roaming stations and, and such. There are three different uh, handshakes which are taken roughly from uh, TLS. Uh, which is well, which requires three round trips. Uh, then we have a stateful connection, which requires a bit of a state uh, in the um, in the first uh, round trip. Um, it has a, it also has a weaker form of uh, perfect forward secrecy, which means that basically you don't have you do not have a, um, a one key a one ephemeral key generated by the server for every connection, but just one key shared uh, with every connection for like five minutes, then you drop it and uh, generate a new one and go on like this. It still works, both quick and minimal T do it like this, and uh, uh, although it's not as safe and as uh, um, well as as robust as the as the as having a perfect forward secrecy per connection. Then finally, we have a one round trip uh, way to do the connection, which, however, needs to uh, synchronize the, the keys with the DNSSEC, so you continuously roll out new keys, and this is the way you do perfect forward secrecy. Um, again, this is formally verified uh, through proverbial models. Um, you can uh, have a look at them, it's all, uh, it's all on the web. And, uh, and the authentication is actually token-based, as we said before, which uh, makes it very easy to, um, to manage. And uh, tokens are actually just uh, random strings of uh, well, like uh, 256, um, 256 bits. Um, so there is no signing required for tokens, uh, uh, which is something nice that comes from taking out the uh, the clock uh, requirements, the clock synchron synchronization requirements. So um, another thing that uh, we 
we use inside the, the authentication is uh, authorization, which is it's not something that OAuth introduced, but uh, uh, it's something that OAuth uses uh, um, very thoroughly. Uh, actually, OAuth has uh, another nice thing that is an application authentication, where you put the uh, put the identification and, uh, of this application and your password inside the binary, which then everybody can get. So, <laughs> uh, but the, the actual authorization part is the scope. Uh, so when you when you develop the application, you see in the documentation stuff like using user read, the file write to limit what the application can do. Uh, we have the same thing in Ferrier, but uh, we. Um, we put it in a lattice to um, to both enumerate uh, easily enumerate uh, and uh, uh, and walk through this. So while we still have a device identification, not an application identification, um, like OAuth, uh, giving a hierarchical scope to uh, to the authorization allows us to tie a single token to an authorization and uh, do fun stuff like. Um, Limiting the uh, the token uh, authorization without regenerating the token at multiple points, so we can limit the authorization at both the uh, the authentication server because every authentication works uh, right through there, and uh, at the client manager uh, point. This means a couple of different things. First, that application absolutely do not manage anything related to tokens, handshakes, authorizations, nothing like that. They only get the keys and the, uh, and the IP addresses to directly connect to, to the service. Um, the, the lattice needs to be synchronized between servers, uh, between service authentication server and client. Uh, this is because the user, so that the user uh, in the, can actually select uh, and limit the um, for example, an application that you're testing to a specific scope. And uh, the limit is enforced by the protocol itself. It's not a self-limit from the, from the application. So uh, even when you're testing a third-party application, this way you can be even more uh, safe on the, uh, on the application limit. Um, there is some hardening inside all of this, uh, um, all of this key exchange and uh, generation of tokens. So, for example, uh, um, there are uh, shared secrets between the client manager and the authentication server and service, which enable, uh, which are basically just uh, strings of that sort uh, with the tokens. And I am actually experimenting also with uh, uh, something like um, hashed OTPs, so so that you can actually check uh, how many times uh, um, uh, a token has been used in the in the service, and avoid things like uh, token stealing and being immediately notified about that. Um, still, just a couple of the things of these things, like putting a, another uh, public key in the trust uh, service enable us to completely uh, take away that um, the nice uh, single point of failure that is the, uh, the authentication server. That, that would usually be the, the first thing an hacker would target, right? It manages all the authentication, it has, it has all the tokens, but, even if, but now, thanks to some, uh, some just soaring of shared secrets, um, even if you hack into an authentication server, uh, all you will manage to do is to force the the the, um, the 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 hosting of the authentic the the sysadmin of the authentication server to just regenerate the shared secrets, which um, um, which will also have uh, a nice side effect that uh, every client will be immediately notified of uh, a breach of uh, things like uh, the service or the authentication server. So, um, so we will be able to, um, to me immediately know something like that, and it will also help in uh, disclosure, uh, um, in, this, yeah, in, in disclosing this, this type of breaches. The end result of all of this, again, is a formally verified 
secure transport where all kind of transport are included and easily accessible to the uh, to the end user. Uh, the, since uh, every token is managed again by the client service, the user only has to decide whether to allow an application to uh, to access what it has to to access or not. Uh, Application and services never see again authentication data, uh, so we have less and less uh, uh, security uh, related stuff inside the the applications, which is a nice thing. Um, we have uh, a forced maximum authorization, and uh, yeah, the authentication server is no longer a single point of failure. So, what's the status of all of this? Uh, Liberator Q, the forward error correction uh, um, implementation of Raptor Q, uh, works. Um, I need a couple of approvals to uh, roll out the new stable release. Uh, everything is LGPL3. Ferrir uh, uh, and the library implementing it is still not finished. Um, currently, uh, Handshake works, uh, the Trust model works. Uh, um, the connection is set up, but uh, we need to finish the um, we need to finish the control flow, which is well, a big part of uh, having a connection. But still, everything is managed through plugin arch architecture, uh, which is very uh, thorough. So, so you can actually add and uh, delete stuff uh, as you want, and uh, experiment with everything. And uh, that's it. Everything is on the website. And uh, please have a look at it. And uh, <laughs> any any questions? Yeah, thanks a lot. If there are any questions, please go to the microphones in front or at the end. I don't know if I can express this well, but I wonder about using it with an RPC protocol. Oh, can you can you speak up a bit, please? I wonder about using it with an RPC protocol where there is a request and a response, and they may be overlapping. Um, on one of your slides, you said it can be like datagram or data stream ordered or unordered, uh, reliable or unreliable. Uh, so yeah, I guess well, I'm thinking of uh, reliable, um, if a request is a datagram, it might be bigger than a packet though, but it does not need to be ordered. For example, you could send out three requests and then get the replies in a different order. Yep. Uh, it's yeah, a problem you, over TCP because you have the head of line blocking. And yep. So uh, do you accommodate this and do you have some RPC framework that you suggest using with it so the application could actually I, I've not gotten through uh, something like the um, developing an RPC protocol uh, uh, tailored to this, uh, but yeah, you can you can actually choose per stream uh, a combination of one of the of the three um, uh, of the three uh, features, and uh, and just use it. You can actually have. Uh, uh, also, big messages in uh, in, a da in a datagram uh, fashion, because the uh, the message is uh, split uh, between uh, multiple uh, uh, multiple packets, so you're not limited to the to the size of a packet for your datagram uh, messages. And if you lost one packet, it would retransmit one packet, not the whole datagram. Yeah, that's yeah, that depends on the. Um, well, on, on what you choose for error correction uh, and whether you have a, a datagram which is which, which was unreliable or, or reliable, yeah. Any further questions? No. Then thanks once again to Luca and a warm well 